Praise God. <laughs> this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, Master. Oh, things are happening. Amen. Tell your neighbor you're in the things that are happening. You better be prepared. <laughs> in Ephesians chapter 2. Glory. Ephesians 2. Hallelujah. Thank you. Lord. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Is everybody there? What's it say? And you he made alive. Hello. You he made what? Alive. alive. Why? Because we were dead. That's what you call the walking dead. Anybody under darkness is dead. And you who he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So you and I were born under the wrath of God. Amen. We were born in darkness. That's why you must be born again. But God who is rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses. He made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. Now what is grace again? God's plan of escape. It isn't some unmerited favor, which is doctrines of demons. Hello. It is not the truth. It is God's plan of escape. Nobody gets favored. You earn it. Amen. To think that you have favor without earning it is stupid. Does everybody get it? Everybody earns favor from God. He gives us an opportunity to earn it. Amen? Amen? So by following along with grace, you will earn God's favor. It says you and I were saved by grace. Well, that means there's a part that you and I must participate. Because as the word say, you must work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. That means you must work out. What does work out? Cooperate. Amen? Cooperate. So in this, it is so foolish that people are still being caught up in that doctrine, which is not from God. It's from beneath. It's a wisdom of this world, not from above. To think that you're going to enter heaven while still serving the devil is pretty dumb. Hallelujah. Everybody okay? <laughs> Verse uh, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. For by grace, by your cooperation, you've been what? Saved. And raised up us up together and made us what? Sit together where? In heavenly places. Wow. In heavenly places. So you and I are already positioned in those places. But the enemy is trying to dethrone us and get us removed from there. So without cooperation, you can't stay in that position. It takes cooperation to maintain it as a spiritual position that gives you authority and insight over all things. Does everybody understand? So you and I must take advantage of this position and see all things. 
So we're going to need some wisdom and discernment to maintain that position. See, the devil's got many positions and seats taken in government. This position is a governmental position in the body of Christ. It is a position that was placed for me and you. But we must maintain that position. And it takes cooperation. It takes consistency. It takes denial of self. It takes assembling. It takes to be filled with the Spirit of God. Why? Because you've got to have power to maintain it. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. In verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceedingly riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been what? Saved through what? Faith that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's what he's talking about. In other words, it's not by labor works. It's by cooperating with the Spirit of God. Because there's a lot of people going out there feed, clothing, and sheltering people. They're doing a lot of good works. But they're out of order. They're disconnected. They're still touching things that are unclean. They're still out there using dope. Still out there lying and manipulating. Still fornicating. See, they just justify in their minds. I've met many individuals that justify in their minds that are out there selling dope and then go out there and preach two days later and justify what they're doing. That's not how it is. You and I must maintain fruits of righteousness all the way home. Not just when we feel like it. Amen? Is everybody okay? Praise God. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. That we should what? Walk in them. So you and I were destined. We were children under wrath of God. We were headed towards the pit. Amen? Then Jesus intervened in our life. We hit enough roadblocks got dragged through enough bushes, had enough heartaches, hurt enough people, especially ourselves, and finally said, I can't live this way any longer. There's got to be more to this life than this, just this. There's got to be more to life than being a, a wife, a husband, working. There's got to be more to life than having children and having a family. There's more to life than all of these things, more. Much more. See, the world wants to keep us limited by just those desires, those wants. But there's more. There's a relationship with the one that created you. There's a place that he's got place for you in the, in the heavenly places where you are not only a joint heir of him, but all things are yours. And you have access to everything. But this is granted to those who are cooperating it's not granted to those who are not cooperating. Of course, it's not granted to someone who's ignorant about it. He says, my people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. So if you don't know what's yours, you don't get it. <laughs> That's how the devil operates. If you don't know what's yours, you don't get it. So people try to get up to heaven multiple ways. Jesus said, there's only one way up, and that's through me. There's only one way to the Father, and that's through me. Everything else is considered witchcraft. 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 Which is curses, spells, control. You got all these new agers that are still out there hugging trees. They got idols. They worship stones. They think they get power from all these things. The only thing they do is open themselves up to more demonic activity. And they wonder why they have problems or they can't advance. There's too much limitation set upon them and too many open doors of demonic activity. In Ephesians 4, why we're here. Everyone say, I'm going from the pit to the palace. Glory. Ephesians 4, verse 1. 
Let's speak it together. Therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of your calling with which you were called. Worthy. He explains a little bit about worthy. He says, with all loneliness. That means humility, humbleness, gentleness, with long suffering. Yes. Bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So there's four things he talks about. Walk worthy of your calling, right? What Number one is humbleness and honesty. Humbleness and honesty. Humbleness and honesty. Come on, write it down. Humbleness and honesty is the first one. What's the second one? Humbleness and long-suffering. If you can't be honest, you certainly can't be humble. Humbleness and hu humble and long suffering. The third one is loving and enduring. Walk worthy of your calling with what? Humble and honesty, humble, long suffering, loving and enduring. And the fourth one is being filled with the Spirit as a, and a peacemaker. Staying filled with the Spirit and a peacemaker. Hallelujah. Let's go a little further. It says, verse 4, there's one body and one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, there was, a, 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 there was already a measure of God's plan given to me and you. As we started a little bit and cooperated with a little bit, he gave you more. Verse 8, therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lowest parts of the earth. In other words, he went into hell and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave from the devil. Amen. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for what? Equipping, for training. Training. Training for what? Reigning. If you're not trained up, you never advance. You stay stagnant. Some people are content right where they are. You shouldn't. That's content. There's an area of contentness, but then there's an area where you want more. But it takes more cooperation to get more. It takes more denial of yourself to get more. It takes more of you coming out of the world. It takes more sanctification. It takes more to cut loose to get more. Remember, Jesus said that we must die. Amen? Remember when Jesus showed up? What did John the Baptist? What did John the Baptist said, I must decrease that he could what? increase so there's an, a place where you and I must constantly fall into a place where we're constantly decreasing of ourself and increasing of him it doesn't stop it gets deeper deeper and deeper but you have the choice because he's given you a free will to cooperate with the deepestness of denying yourself or you can stay right where you are and never grow and people are content with that. But they're also dangerous. They're very dangerous people. Because they're easily swayed. They live by emotion. They're easily tossed to and fro. They're unstable. Amen? Hallelujah. For the equipping of the saints, verse 12, and for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Well, you think that body of Christ will be edified if it's doing the right thing? If people are cooperating? If people are maintaining a thirst and hunger? If they fall on, don't fall into the deception of lukewarmness? 
Amen. Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a what? Perfect man. That means we're one. Perfect man. To the measure or the stature of the fullness of Christ or the fullness of the anointing. That we should no longer be children, immature, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind. That word wind means voice. It means what? Voice. That we're not moved by every voice we hear. That we're not moved by every emotional voice that we feel. Those are called winds of doctrine. By the trickery of men. And the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up. Everyone say grow up. And all things into him who is the head Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, working according to the effect of working by which every part does its share. Does its share. See, people are not doing their share. That's the problem. They're not maintaining that thirst and hunger. They're not maintaining that place of worship. They're not maintaining that place and position where you and I are blessed every spiritual blessing and seated in heavenly places. They're not maintaining those positions. They drift from them, and the enemy comes in and then blocks. Then the rest of the body of Christ has to make up for the other ones that are blowing it. So we gradually move forward instead of a rapidness. You know, when I first got saved, I didn't understand it. I couldn't understand, because people. I used to get prophecies all the time. You'll be ministering to the body of Christ. I was thinking, for what? What the heck, we're all supposed to know Jesus, right? Why are we still ministering to the body of Christ? He said, the anointing will what? Teach you all things. Then I realized later that it was a process of training after salvation. I didn't know that then. But there is a training. But see, people aren't willing to accept the training. They think after they've been saved, they know Jesus. I know Jesus. They know more emotionally than they do truth, truthfully. They don't hear his conviction. They don't sense his chastisement. They just go along life still doing whatever. Never really doing a self-examination to be free because you can't be free with a true, honest self-examination. You'll stay in that same place till you give up your last breath. You may fool man, but you can't fool God. Hallelujah. Is everybody okay? <laughs> Praise God. All right. Let's grow a little further. 1 Corinthians 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. You want to make it to the palace, right? <laughs> Glory. Well, you won't make it if you don't learn. If you don't learn, you will what? Burn. You'll get burned. The devil will easily burn you. Verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. It says, For the message of the cross is what? Foolishness. To those who are what? Perishing. But to us who are being saved, do you see the word being saved? It says being saved. Being saved. Being saved. That's the process of salvation. It's called redemption. There's a fullness of redemption that comes. So you and I are in the process of constantly maintaining salvation. Everybody see that now. You, make sure you highlight that. Being saved. It is the power for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The wisdom of the wise. And bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. See, there's a wisdom of the world that God calls foolish. People pay, pay great amount of money to go get the worldly wisdom. They hang all their certificates up and all the stuff from worldly wisdom. <laughs> Calling some doctors, psychiatrists, and so forth. And, there, and there's an area of fairness in that. But if Jesus is not behind it, it ain't worth poop. See, the kingdom must be behind everything. Jesus must be behind everything. What good is it to be an encounter if Jesus isn't behind it? Then you'll be a thief. Does everybody get it? You, Jesus must be involved in everything. What good is it to be a mechanic if Jesus isn't in it? So everything that you and I learn, we labor onto the kingdom. But God gives us the talents. That's why we need to exchange every worldly tanet, talent and give it to him. So he restores it to me and you anoint it. So that it's used for the kingdom of God, not to promote ourselves, but to promote him. Hallelujah. In verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. So the wisdom of the world does not know God. <laughs> Think about that. The wisdom of the world does not know God. In fact, the wisdom of the world will do everything it can to keep you from knowing God. Why? Because it puffs up. It doesn't humble. Verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign that Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But those who are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh everyone say no flesh should glory in his presence no flesh should glory in his presence again it is a message of the cross it is the footsteps and journey of Christ on earth before the cross and after the cross. This is the message of the cross. Exchanging the wisdom of the world and all <laughs> of its books and gurus and mysticals and demonic witchcraft and mind control and bringing demonic oppression and possession to individuals for the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding from above in Christ Jesus brought us in and brought was brought to me and you in the person called Christ Jesus all brought to me and you and transferred and imparted in me and you by the Holy Spirit see let's go a little further glory to God is everybody all right oh hallelujah verse 28 uh, verse 27, for God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and the, God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing that things are, that no flesh and glory in his presence, but of him you are what? In Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that it is written he who glories let him glory in the Lord wow 
So there's a place where he gets us and positions us where there is manifestation of righteousness, sanctification, and the fullness of redemption that waits for me and you. 1 Thessalonians 4. Why? Because we're coming from the pit to the what? Palace. From the pit to the palace. P and P. No, PTP. <laughs> pit to palace. Praise God. Hallelujah. First Corinthians, or yeah, First Thessalonians 4. <laughs> Glory. Oh, happy days. In verse 1, everyone say, finally. Finally. <laughs> finally got there. Praise God. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to what? Walk and to please God. How you ought to walk and to... Listen, if, you don't, if you're not connected in fellowship, can you maintain walking and pleasing God? No, it's impossible. You'll be easily misled. You'll be emotionally led. Emotional decisions. You'll be an emotional humanite instead of an eternal light. And God can't trust you. God can't trust people that make decisions by emotions. He will not. Doesn't mean he doesn't love us. But there are people you love that you don't trust. Amen. Amen. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your what? Sanctification, your separation unto him. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. In other words, come out from among them and quit touching unclean things. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. So here the Lord is explaining. He's given a parallel. There are many of my children who are still acting like they don't know me. Living a life like they don't know me. No understanding of sanctification. No desire to separate themselves. Still living a life of the flesh. In verse 6, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. And as we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in, in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who also has given us his Holy Spirit. Powerful. So we are to know how to walk and to please God. That takes something called divine order. See, if your priorities are not in divine order, you won't please him. You can try, but you'll do it in your own strength. And that will never please God because that's called flesh. But there is a priority of divine order. Please him in thought, words, and in deeds, and character. Please him in decisions. Please him in purchases. Please him in giving. Please him. Guided by the Holy Spirit, which brings us into a divine order and a priority. He sets things in priority. To what? To fulfill your call, to fulfill your purpose, and to fulfill your destiny. Many will never fulfill their call, purpose, and destiny. Many. Why? Because their house is not in divine order. Their temple is not in divine order. Their thoughts are not in divine order. Their words are not in divine order. Their lives are not in divine order. Why? Because they still think they own part of their life. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. So we want to fill our call, purpose, and destiny. It's of his will for us, not our will for us. Remember, Jesus came to fulfill the will of the Father, not his own. Since when do we think we came to fulfill our will and not his? We do not push our will or agenda on others. We enforce the will of God in our own lives. Amen? 
so others can follow us. So we want to enforce the will of God in our life. We're not trying to impose God's will in other people's lives. There's got to be an area where they want what you want, what you have. But if you're not living that life, who wants what that person has? If their life is up, up and down, unstable. Listen, and it's not about wealth or prosperity, but there are people that are poor in spirit. Does everybody understand it? They're poor. He says, why? Because if your soul isn't converted, you're not prospering either. So their lack of conversion of their soul is preventing them from moving forward. They are, and they think themselves spiritual because they know some verses. And they even memorize the Bible, some of them. But they think they're so spiritual. But the word says, submit to God, resist the devil. Amen? Submit to God, resist. Or you, look, and if you're not submitting to all the things of God, then you're not denying yourself. And you're headed from the palace to the pit <laughs> instead of from the pit to the palace. Is everybody okay? Hallelujah. I'm going to go somewhere right now. We're going to Genesis. Genesis 37. There's a wonderful example of someone that went from the pit to the palace. His name is Joseph. What a wonderful example. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan, where all the giants were, Nephilim. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And a lad was with the sons of Bilal and the sons of Zelpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. <laughs> so he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. And there they were uh, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, he said, my sheaf arose, and all the others stood up. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to mine. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or you shall indeed have dominion over us? So they hate him even more and more for his dreams and from his words. Joseph just could not keep things to himself. <laughs> he brought most of the stuff on himself. Hello. <laughs> Go to verse 18. Now, they actually had a plan. They wanted to kill Joseph, all right? His brothers were tired of this. They said, this is it. Now, when they saw Joseph afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. <laughs> Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into the what? Pit. How many of the devil wants to cast you into the pit? And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will come, become of his dreams. So they were going to lie. So who was behind all of this? The devil. Demons. Amen. <laughs> but Reuben heard it, and his brother, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, 
the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into the pit. And the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. And they lifted their eyes and looked and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm, and myrrh, myrrh and on their way to carry them down to Egypt. Egypt is known as the house of bondage. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. So let's not kill him. Let's, you know, first of all, let's throw him in a pit and leave him there. You know what? Let's make a profit out of this. Let's sell him. So he sold him to the Ishmaelites. Nice, huh? So he brought him from the pit into slavery. Amen? That's what the devil wants to do with me and you. Once we have escaped the pit, he still wants to bring us back into slavery. 1 Corinthians 6. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 12. Now let's start at verse 9. Verse 9. Verse 9. Is everybody there? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelries, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are what? Helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be put under, brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to the harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. So when people have sex out of marriage, curses are brought on both of them from each family line. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual sin and morality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, and you have and you have from God, whom you have from God, and you are what? You are not your own. Everyone say, I'm not my own. I do not own this temple. I was bought. For verse 20, for you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we see here with Joseph, he was not only put in the pit, then he was sold into slavery. But God paid the price for you and I to come out of slavery if we'll cooperate. You don't come out of the pit without a rope being thrown to you. I and mean, then you must grab it and participate with the escape or you stay there. Amen? Go to Genesis 39. Genesis 39.
Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Again, that's a house of bondage. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian bought him from the Ishmaelites. This is his second sale. Who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph. Again, the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Why was Joseph successful? Because he cooperated. He didn't let anything get between him and the Lord. No matter what the circumstances were. Even though he was put in a pit. Even though he was sold for two, two, two times. <laughs> he didn't budge. Amen. And the Lord was with him and made him successful. Even though he was in, in the house of a master of bondage. The house was under bondage, but Joseph wasn't. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found what? Favor. He found what? Favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. For whose sake? Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. In other words, Joseph took care of everything. And he trusted him. Joseph was honest. He was consistent. He was loyal. Now Joseph was ha handsome in form and appearance, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife basically attacked him. She tried to seduce him. Amen? And in this seduction, he refused her. And in refusing her, he gra she grabbed hold of him and tore her a part of his garment. So when Potiphar came home, she accused Joseph of attacking, of seducing her. And so Potiphar had to do something about it, so he put him in prison where the king's servants go to prison. <laughs> in, verse, in chapter 40. So Joseph gets... Put in the pit. Amen. Sold twice under slavery. Now put in prison. Oh, praise God. In chapter 40 and verse 1. Now it came to pass that after the butler, now so the there was a butler and a chef of the Pharaoh's servants who were put in prison. And it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker, or the baker, of the king of Egypt offended their lord and the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the, ch the chef butler and the chef baker. Chief, I'm sorry. Chief butler and the chief baker. Sheesh. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them. So they were in custody for a while. Now Joseph found favor with the captain of the guard there. Everything Joseph did in prison prospered, because the Lord was with him. Joseph was honest. He didn't manipulate. He was honest. He accepted consequences when he made mistakes. He continued to go forward. He always put the Lord first, nothing else. Then the butler and the baker of, of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream with its an own interpretation. And Joseph came to them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. And he, and he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with them in the custody of the Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, We each have a dream, and there was no one to interpret so Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell them to me, please. Why? Because he was going to go to the Lord. 
Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a wine, a vine was before me, and in the vine there were three branches. It was as though it budded. Its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them in Pharaoh's cup and placed it in the cup cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me when it is well with you. And please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. Now, Joseph got in the flesh. He was, he was relying on a man. Does everybody get it? A man who was put in prison for being corrupt. Pharaoh forgave him and pulled him out. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. So he was justifying himself. <laughs> and of course, Joseph stayed in there longer because he tried to promote himself instead of promoting the Lord. Amen? Is everybody okay? Praise God. Now, let's go to verse 20. Uh, somewhere around there. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast of all of his servants, and he lifted up the head of the uh, chief butler and the chief baker among his servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in the Pharaoh's hand. But he, he, he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted in the dream. Yet the, the uh, chief butler did not remember Joseph, but what? He forgot him. You think God could have brought to remembrance about Joseph? Yes, he could have, but he didn't. Why? Because Joseph stepped out of order. Joseph did what? He stepped out of priority. He stepped out of order. He put himself in priority instead of the Lord. And the Lord said, okay, let's just stay there a little bit longer. Now, <laughs> chapter 41, in verse 1. Then it came to pass at the end of the two full years, two years later, that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them and of the river, and ugly and gunt and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river, and the ugly and the gaunt cows ate. <laughs> gaunt? How about just stinking ugly? <laughs> How about puny and ugly? They were polka dotted. All right. Or they had nothing on them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay, so these other cows were puny and ugly. And they ate up the seven fine-looking ones that were fat and handsome. <laughs> so Pharaoh awoke out of this dream, freaked out. <laughs> and he called all of his servants in there, help! Help! Nobody could interpret so, verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph because somebody had mentioned to him. Somebody remembered him. Who was it? Ah, uh, who was the chief who? Butler. The butler. And Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, 
I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you can understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not me, God. Well, he put God back in place. <laughs> God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river, and such and such and such. There were seven ugly and puny cows, and there were seven fat and handsome ones. Amen? Praise God. In verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. I want you to know that we are in the seven years of plenty right now. We've already been in the first three years, have been completed. There's four years left. Hello. But, another, but after them, seven years of famine will come, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and famine will deplete the land. So, and the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Let's go to verse 41. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had, had him ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried out before him, bowed the knee, so that he set him over the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Now, this is powerful because Joseph came from the pit to the palace. And after that, Pharaoh gave him a wife, and he had children. But, um, but Joseph was still a servant of the Lord. He labored unto the Lord, even in that position, to when even famine came, Joseph was positioned. And he got to restore his family, who threw him in a pit, sold him twelve twice, <laughs> put him into slavery. And all the stuff that Joseph went through, God used to turn to the good. Why? Because now Joseph learned how to become a leader. Remember, Jesus came into the world as a child so that he would know how mankind felt pain, rejection, fear. God did not feel those things. He only feels love because he is the God of love. So he became a human, part human, so that he would know all the things that you and I went through so that he can comfort us in every area of those things. So we would have the opportunity. That's why he paid the price on the cross to exchange all of these emotional, painful things in of our life and put him first and put things back into priority. Does everybody understand that? So you and I are being brought from the pit to the palace, just like Joseph was brought from the pit to the palace. But we got to allow God to restore, not you and me. When you and I restore it, he takes his hand out. Anything you put your hand in, he takes his hand out. Anything his hand is in, it's his responsibility. Amen? Matthew 25. We'll be hard-pressed. Verse 14. Matthew 25, verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is what? 
like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two talents, to another one, to each according to his own what? Ability. So God will never give you any more than you can handle. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received five talents went and traded them with, and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had two talents gained two more talents. But he who had received one went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came and brought five others, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides this. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful. You were honest. You were consistent over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. See, too many people are trying to rule over bigger things when they haven't been faithful with a little yet. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. And then the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man. Reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talents in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For everyone who has, more will be given. And he, who, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be what? Taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant to outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, a faithful servant has divine order and priorities. If you are faithful, you'll go from the pit to the palace. But the moment you begin to come unfaithful and you put yourself in first, your ways, your desires, your will, you will start accessing, headed towards, and leaving from the palace back to the pit. Ephesians chapter 1. And let's go to Philippians 3. I'm sorry. Philippians 3. Oh, hallelujah. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. We've heard this before. How many of y'all will be a faithful steward? Amen. There's great reward. But of course, it takes the formula of denying yourself, pick up the cross, fight, and follow. Anything that gets between you and God becomes an idol. Philippians 3, verse 7, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for what? For Christ, for Christ, for the anointing. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. See, one of the things that I know that happened in my life, I lost everything. But I wasn't looking to get it back. Everything I lost. My wife, children, everything. Vehicles, possessions, everything. But I wasn't looking to get them back. Because when I met Christ, I had everything. To me, I had gained everything. To me, it was everything. If I had to get to that place to do this all over again, to get to that same place, I'd have to. 
because when Christ grabbed hold of me, I realized there wasn't anything more important in my life because without him, there is no life. And now my life was in him and his life was in me. And there's nothing more, nothing more fulfilling. And see, that's what begins to happen. When we get things out of priority, we begin to compromise, even in fulfilling. We begin to do works to bring fulfillment. We begin to do things to try and bring a fulfillment when we need to get in God's presence to bring fulfillment. That's why we must say to him, Lord, you're my fulfillment. You're my fulfillment. Why? Because it's out of your mouth that reconnects. Amen. So he said here, I counted all as rubbish that I may gain Christ. In verse 9. And to be found in him. Found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Being conformed to his death. And he delights in the death of his saints. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I do what? I press on, that I may lay hold of that which, for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward for the things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. Brother, join in following my example. Note those who walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often. And now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lonely body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. That's called full redemption. So you and I have been placed, taken from the pit and headed to the palace. He is positioning us right now. All the things that you've gone through is a purpose of training. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. If you're willing to really reset your priorities, things will work to the good. But if you're not willing to reset your priorities, you will have problems. Because things are not going to get better. They're going to get worse spiritually. But for you and I, it should be getting better. Even though it's getting darker out there, we should be carrying a lighter, more light to shine in a dark place so that the world will see you, as Christ, oh, you will carry something they want. And that's all you have to do is tell them, I'm headed to the palace. Amen? Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. Let the seed be imparted in each and every one and protected by the blood of Christ so that it grows and bears fruit for your glory. Lord, we thank you for this time and opportunity as you continue to to expose the direction of the pit and keep before us the path to the palace. You are awesome and you are well honored here. So we thank you and we promise to give you all the glory as we continue on our journey in Jesus' name. Prepare your hearts for the